There being eight ayes and 57 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. It being after two o'clock, the committee will now report progress. Thank you. The committee reports progress. We'll move to questions without notice. I'll give senators a moment to return to their seats. Ask senators to resume their seats. I'll call Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Over the past week, New South Wales and Queensland have been devastated by bushfires, leading to three people tragically losing their lives and countless more losing their homes. Weather forecasts are predicting that the situation will only worsen both today and over the coming days. Uh, as we all indicated yesterday, our thoughts are with all of those facing this immediate crisis. Uh, our thanks are with the crews and firefighters battling these fires across the country. And in, in that context, I ask the minister to provide us, the Senate with an update on the current situation being faced by communities in New South Wales and Queensland. The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr uh, President, um, and I thank Senator um, Wong for that question. As we indicated yesterday, our first concern is for the safety uh, and uh, needs of those directly affected. Australians are at their best in difficult times like this. They show incredible spirit, heart and generosity. And our emergency services are once again showing their professionalism and dedication in the face of very difficult conditions. And we thank all the Korean voluntary emergency service personnel fighting these fires. And uh, I acknowledge the comradeship on display by, their, by the contribution to the New South Wales firefighting efforts of interstate personnel from the ICT, South Australia, Tasmania and Victoria. Uh, the Australian Government, of course, continues to stand ready to immediately assist communities impacted by bushfires. Uh, the clear advice that we uh, give to our communities uh, is to plan ahead and be prepared. Now, in terms of uh, updates, uh, devastating fires continue to burn across large parts of northeast New South Wales. Uh, it is important uh, that people remain vigilant of more than 70 fires which are still burning across, across the state. Uh, the New South Wales fires uh, have had a devastating impact on the many affected communities. The New South Wales Rural Fire Service estimates that at least 150 structures have been lost, including a large number of homes. Other property damage and loss includes telecommunications and power infrastructure, bridges and two schools. More than 1,300 firefighters and support personnel, along with 93 aircraft, have been battling these fires. The forecast for today is deeply worrying, and all Commonwealth agencies stand ready to assist state authorities and the community. Catastrophic fire uh, danger is forecast for the Greater Sydney, Greater Hunter and Illawarra Schoolhaven Haven areas today. Um, due to the worsening weather conditions, uh, the first time such conditions have been forecast for Sydney since the new um, fire danger ridings were introduced in 2009. Catastrophic is the highest level of bushfire danger. It means that homes are not designed to withstand a fire under these conditions, and if a fire takes hold during catastrophic fire conditions, lives and homes will be lost. Uh, in Queensland, fires of concern are continuing to burn in southeast Queensland. Twelve homes have been confirmed as destroyed. Lives and property uh, are... Senator Cormann, Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I thank the minister for his answer. Uh, he, in his answer, referenced assistance being provided or offered by other states, and I ask him of, to detail if he's able to that assistance, uh, uh, the offers of assistance from other states and also other countries. Uh, and how those offers are being facilitated. Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. I thank uh, Senator Wong for that supplementary. As I've indicated, uh, there have been offers of support which have been greatly appreciated uh, from a number of jurisdictions uh, uh, into, uh, into uh, New South Wales in particular and Queensland uh, out of um, the uh, ICT, South Australia, Tasmania and Victoria. In uh, I next question, uh, both Senator um, um, Senator Reynolds and Senator um, McKenzie will provide further updates uh, in relation to uh, support provided through our defence uh, forces and indeed uh, provide a more thorough update uh, going through all of the detail uh, in relation uh, to support provided in 
um, relevant uh, local communities. But I should also uh, say, in terms of providing uh, further, a further um, update, uh, that in Western Australia we remain uh, concerned. Um, where severe to extreme fire danger is forecast to die over southern and central uh, um, fire Order. weather areas. Senator Cormann. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you. In addition to bushfires in New South Wales and Queensland, warnings have been issued or are present in other parts of the country, uh, Western Australia, also parts of South Australia. Can the minister update the Senate on the status of bushfire warnings in other states and territories? Senator Cormann. Um, thank you very much. Uh, well, as I was just uh, indicating, we remain, uh, we continue to watch uh, Western Australia and other parts of Australia with concern uh, in relation uh, to Western Australia. Uh, there is a severe to extreme fire danger. Uh, forecast today or southern and central uh, fire uh, weather areas in relation to South Australia. Uh, it might well be that uh, Senator McKenzie has further updates. I don't have any uh, specific updates uh, in, front of, in front of me today. Uh, but may I also uh, advise the Chamber, may I also advise uh, the Chamber that uh, in terms of um, defence support, uh, in terms of emergency management Australia, firebombing aircraft uh, continues to be in action against these fires. Our national uh, aerial firefighting arrangements are ensuring the best possible aerial firefighting equipment is available to protect Australians. Um, and, and of course, defence uh, also is, provided, uh, pro is uh, available to provide support and Senator Reynolds will provide further information in relation to this. Uh, the Royal Australian Air Force aircrafts have transported firefighters from Canberra. Order, Senator like. Cormann. Before I come to you, Senator McGrath, I'd like to draw to honourable the attention of honourable senators the presence in the chamber and gallery of a delegation from the Cook Islands, led by the honourable Henry Puna, Prime Minister of the Cook Islands. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and particularly to the Senate. Thank you. Senator McGrath. I uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister update the Senate? on what assistance the Australian Defence Force is providing to the current firefighting effort. The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator McGrath for his most important question. Uh, today, all of our thoughts and prayers are with those in Queensland and New South Wales who are dealing with the threat and also now the consequences of these catastrophic bushfires. Already, they've endured days and long nights of anxiety and disruption not knowing where the fires will strike next. And firstly, I do pay tribute to our amazing emergency services workers who are battling um, these fires in extraordinarily and almost unimaginable circumstances. But I particularly thank our ADF personnel who are supporting the firefighting efforts. Uh, Royal Australian Air Force 737 and C-130 aircraft have already transported firefighters and their equipment from Canberra, Adelaide and Hobart to Port Macquarie an area of high and immediate need. Uh, Singleton and Lismore defence bases in New South Wales are already also providing accommodation and catering to firefighters from the Victorian County uh, Fire Authority. Today and tomorrow, Army and Naval he helicopters will also support firefighter movements, air observers and civilian rescuers as uh, requested. Yesterday, I asked the Chief of Defence Force to give an order to all military base commanders making clear that they have the authority to use local defence assets and resources to respond to any local contingencies. Defence is also postured to provide further airlift and is prepared to provide assistance in areas such as aerial fire reconnaissance, logistical support and also engineering on request. It is important to remember that our ADF members are not firefighters and they are not trained firefighters but they are doing everything that they can to help the community uh, in this current catastrophic circumstances. Senator McGrath, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister update the Senate on what further Australian defence support can be provided, if requested, by the states and territories? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, as Minister for Defence, at this time of unprecedented fire threat, I am focused on ensuring that the ADF are ready to provide additional support for the nation's frontline uh, first responders. Our first call is always to our regular forces and the capabilities that they bring with us. But work is also now underway to scope the availability and also the readiness of our highly capable reserve forces across all three services. 
ADF reservists are already regularly employed for emergency disaster assistance and disaster recovery under voluntary what is called call for arrangements, which means voluntary call for. Our reserve uh, emergency support forces already have a 120 person capacity in Brisbane and also 130 uh, person capacity in Sydney to provide transport, logistics and other required uh, and requested support. Order, Senator Reynolds. Senator McGrath, a final supplementary question. Can the minister outline what longer term preparations are underway to prepare for this high risk weather season, including mobilisation of reserves? Senator Reynolds. Thank you. Uh, in addition to the call for uh, activities that we now have underway, I'm also working with Defence to work through how we can provide uh, further response to larger, more severe and also more protracted uh, natural disasters uh, beyond, as I've said, the call for arrangements. A broader response is also uh, can include a compulsory call out of reserves if the situation requires. Reserve forces can be called out by the Governor-General in accordance with Section 28 of the Defence Act. This mechanism has never been used. Defence is working through every aspect at the moment of such a call-out to ensure that we are prepared if required. Defence will continue tasking discrete elements of the Army Reserves and Naval and also Air Force Reserves using exist existing voluntary call for arrangements, again as the circumstances require. And can I just say on behalf of us all, thank you very much. I'm very proud Order. of our men Senator and women Reynolds. in uniform and for the support. Senator Ayres. Uh, Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Mackenzie. In a deal with One Nation, the minister has finally released the draft dairy code of conduct for consultation. Key elements of the draft code have changed since January, including watering down the express prohibition of retrospective price drops for dairy farmers. Why has the minister watered down the draft code released by former minister David Littleproud? The Minister of Agriculture, Senator Mackenzie. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank the senator for his question. Uh, the Nationals have stood up for our farming families and communities for 100 years, and we unashamedly want to see a prosperous and sustainable dairy industry going forward. That means opening up markets, fighting on competition policies and decreasing regulation for our farmers. At the election, there were two plans for the dairy industry oh. put forward. One was the Labor Party's position to uh, re-regulate the dairy industry. The other was a suite of initiatives that actually went to the heart of the issues, which one was going to be putting in a mandatory code of conduct to regulate the relationships between processors and farmers, to make sure farmers get a fair deal after they'd been suffering from egregious behaviour from processors for many, many years. Uh, making sure we put downward pressure on energy prices for our farmers because it is one of the high input costs. So we have order, Senator Mackenzie. Senator Ayres on a point of order. On, on relevance, uh, Mr. President, the question was very specific. Uh, why has the minister watered down the draft code released by former Agriculture Minister David Littleproud? The minister, I ask you to draw her to that question. The minister is allowed to be directly relevant to the preamble as well. At this point, I do consider the minister to be directly relevant. Um, they don't, the minister doesn't have to accept the premise of a question. Um, I'm listening carefully. Um, I'll call Senator Mackenzie to continue. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I absolutely categorically reject the suggestion that there is a watering down of uh, the treatment of processes and the relationship between farmers and processes with the code. I'm happy to go through for the senator the process our government has undertaken since the ACCC report recommended Order. that we have a mandatory dairy code. So on April 2018, on the back of Murray Goldman and Fonterra clawbacks and step downs, ACCC uh, released a recommendation that we implement a mandatory dairy code, which we agreed to do. 
In October 2018, we announced the first round of consultation with industry. And this was the very first opportunity for a dairy industry that is quite fractured to come together around what were the measures that they could agree on that could be part of a mandatory code. In January 2019, a set of draft clauses for the code was released and a second Order, round of consultation was commenced. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. We'll try again, Mr President. On ABC's AM this morning, the minister refused four times to make clear who had requested this change. Will the minister now make clear which stakeholders requested this change of wording? We were all listening. Senator Mackenzie. Thank you, Mr. President. And I am going through the process so we get the consultation in January around the draft clauses develops nine principles that go to a raft of issues around the, how the parties treat each other, requiring annual uh, set date, the process as publicly re released standard form agreements, and prohibit prescriptive step downs unless in specific circumstances order. Senator such McKenzie. as force majeure. Senator Mejure. Watt on a, on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. President. The minister refused to answer this four times this morning on radio. Will she now answer it for the fifth time? Okay, Senator, what I'm going to ask you to at least attempt to make a point of direct relevance rather than, rather than pursue a follow-up question. The minister has repeatedly not answered this question okay. in the media. So We'd like an answer here. The, the question went to the changes. I'm listening. Order. The question from Senator Ayres went specifically to the changes in the code and which stakeholders requested them. Senator Wong, you want— uh, Just to clarify, uh, um, Mr President, it was not the, all changes in the code. There was a very specific yes. wording change, which was referenced in the primary. primary. That is the issue that the minister was pressed on this was, morning on AM. Yeah, I was you. coming to that, um, which is the question specifically went to that specified change in the code. and. Where, and which stakeholder asked the minister to change it. I'm going to decree that if the minister is speaking about the change, that specific change in the code, I do consider that to be directly relevant, and I'm listening very carefully. The minister has 36 seconds remaining to answer that specific point. Senator, okay, Senator McKenzie. Late. Well, thank you, Mr. President, for the opportunity. So, as I was saying, the, claw the principle that was consulted on, which goes directly to your question, Senator, was to prohibit prospective pre step downs unless in specific cir circumstances such as force majeure or exceptional market circumstances or major changes in global market circumstances. Now, those principles were sent off to the office to, of the drafters, and what came back was that we must not vary the agreement unilaterally order. for any Senator, reasons Senator other McKenzie, than— Senator McKenzie, Senator Wong on a point of order. This again goes to process. She was asked which stakeholders requested the change. Um, and, the and, and, take that I'll take the interjection. Is the minister the stakeholder who requested the change? Um, Senator Wong, as I said, I think, in my view, as long as the minister is talking about I will rule when there's silence. As long as the minister is addressing the specific change in the question about that part of the code, I think the minister is being directly relevant. I cannot direct her how to answer a question, but she must be specific to that specific change and the very specific nature of that question. I believe at the point that point of order was raised, the minister was talking about that specific change. Senator McKenzie. There were no stakeholders that requested a change. The principles, as I've Order. said Senator numerous McKenzie, times— time has, time has expired for the answer. Senator, Senator Ayres, a draft final code. supplementary question. Following the release of the draft code, Nationals, Nationals member for Line, Dr Gillespie, warned that it dudded farmers and refused to rule out a leadership tilt over the issue. Why is the minister siding with big producers instead of protecting dairy farmers? Yeah. Yeah. Senator McKenzie. Oh, Sen Mr President, thank you very, very much. Well, Senator, you don't Order. actually understand what the National Party's advocacy in this area has been for years. It is in competition policy. It is getting, actually addressing the issues of the dairy industry, which are high energy prices, high fodder costs. They've increased by 50 per cent thanks to the drought. And if you are a dairy farmer in areas of, that require irrigation, 
water has increased over 300 per cent in the pricing. So the input costs for our dairy farmers are making it incredibly difficult for them to get the margins that they need, which is why our government took a suite of initiatives to the election. One is the mandatory dark code of conduct to regulate uh, that unconscionable behaviour by some of the processes and recognises that we've got eight very unique Re regions across Australia when it comes to daring. What works in northern Queensland is not going to work in WA, is not going to work in Order. South Australia, Senator and we McKenzie. need a code Time for Time for the answer has expired. Order on my left. Order. Senator Waters. Order. Senator Waters is on Thanks. her feet. Thanks, President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Today, a member of the government, <coughs> Mr Barnaby Joyce, said I acknowledge that the two people who died were most likely people who voted for the Green Party, so I'm not going to start attacking them. Do you support these vile comments? And is it now the government's position that it's not okay to talk about the climate crisis, but it is okay Order. to talk about people who burned alive in bushfires and how they might have voted? Will you Order. offer an unconditional apology to the families of the victims, and will you take disciplinary action against Mr Barnaby Joyce? Order on my left during the questions, please. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair. Uh, I mean, the short answer to the initial question is no, I don't think uh, these were appropriate uh, comments in the circumstances. And that is because uh, I believe and we believe that it is not an appropriate time uh, to bring politics uh, into uh, this debate when people have lost their lives and while these same fires continue to burn. Um, equally, uh, the time to have policy discussions is not in the middle of an operational response. Uh, it is not in the middle of people literally uh, fighting for their homes and fighting for their survival. Um, as the Prime Minister has stated, all of our attention as a government remains focused on supporting our firefighters and volunteers and on ensuring that uh, people uh, in fire-affected communities are kept safe and continue to receive the support they need. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thank you, President. In April this year, former fire chiefs and fire experts asked to talk with the government about the climate crisis and the lack of preparedness for catastrophic fire, but the Prime Minister didn't want to meet them. They then asked again in September, but the Prime Minister didn't want to meet them. They have still not had a meeting. If the government didn't want to talk about the climate crisis and fires in April, you didn't want to talk about it in September. You still don't want to talk about it now. When is the right time to talk about how coal is making these fires Order. worse? Senator Waters. Senator Cormann. Um, thank you very much, uh, um, Mr President. Uh, I, I don't accept the premise of the question. Uh, I, a meeting uh, was offered and that offer wasn't taken up. That is my advice. Uh, my advice uh, is that a meeting was offered and the uh, meeting offer was not taken up. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Uh, thanks, President. Um, John Howard responded to the Port Arthur tragedy by quickly putting in place a national firearms agreement, which was supported across the parliament and across the country. Given the climate crisis that is fuelling catastrophic bushfires across the country, will your government now convene urgent cross-party talks to put in place a national agreement to phase out coal? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I would very respectfully refer Senator Waters uh, to my primary answer to her first question. Yeah. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. In recent months, the Australian energy market operator warned that the outage of two Victorian power units poses a significant risk of insufficient supply this summer. The Australian Energy Regulator released data showing sharp reductions in surplus generation in Victoria and New South Wales, and we know the coming summer will be very much hot and dry. This all points to a greater likelihood of high power prices and power cuts this summer. Given that Victoria is South Australia's only link to the national grid, I'm particularly concerned about the potential for a blackout in Victoria affecting my home state of South Australia. Minister, has the government received any recent advice about the potential for blackouts this summer in South Australia or Victoria? The Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Griff uh, for his question, uh, particularly as it relates to uh, energy reliability in our home state of South Australia. And certainly Senator Griff uh, 
uh, I can uh, reassure you that the Morrison government, together with the Marshall Liberal government in South Australia, uh, has been working to ensure enhanced reliability of the grid in South Australia. Uh, recently, the Australian energy market operator uh, released uh, this year's electricity statement of opportunities. Uh, this shows that grid reliability in SA uh, is in fact improving. In 2018, AEMO uh, predicted that and reported that the reliability standard as set by government would in fact be exceeded in South Australia, that there would be heightened risk uh, of blackouts. Uh, going in now, the forecast for 2019 shows that that is no longer the case, and uh, that that reliability standard is, in the context of South Australia, expected to be met. Uh, and it's met by a range of factors, increasing, uh, of course, energy generation in the state, uh, some through renewable capability, but also those that can provide uh, the type of peaking support uh, to provide for reliability. Last week, Minister Taylor opened uh, additional gas power capability on Torrens Island. Uh, the new 210 megawatt Barker Inlet power station will complement uh, the very high shares of intermittent wind and solar generated in South Australia, uh, reducing prices and helping to improve reliability. Uh, we're also pursuing a range of other measures to help with reliability. The main risk in the national electricity market, as you identified, uh, Senator Griff, indeed now comes from Victoria. Uh, in that state, uh, we have seen uh, that the threat of blackouts is real, and that's a result uh, of the shutdown uh, driven by state government policies there of large generators who, and a state government that also continues to insist on a gas ban, uh, which puts real pressures in terms of Order. their energy market Senator generation. Birmingham. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Look, in January this year, Minister, um, the temperatures reached 48 degrees, as you know, in Adelaide, and the electricity system was very much pushed to its limit. Now, generation was insufficient, leading to power cuts in Victoria and average weekly prices of more than $1,000 per megawatt hour in SA and Victoria, the highest on record. What is the government's plan to avoid price surges in South Australia this coming <laughs> summer? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, indeed, that, uh, that additional energy generation uh, in the South Australian market, uh, importantly, uh, will not only contribute to reliability uh, but contribute to a greater stabilisation of power uh, prices in South Australia. And in fact, uh, one of the proof points in terms of the threats that exist now in Victoria uh, relative to South Australia uh, is that uh, Victorian power prices have now overtaken uh, South Australia's as the most expensive uh, energy uh, in the nation. Uh, so our policies uh, are yielding dividends in relation to stability in SA. And that's partly a result of our work, partly a result of the work of the South Australian government and the close collaboration uh, between the two of us. And we continue uh, to work to pursue other opportunities, uh, such as through the underwriting New Generation Investments Program, uh, which is looking at new reliable generation opportunities in South Australia to provide, again, for peaking capacity Order. that can help Senator to Birmingham. smooth the, uh, the system Senator as required. Senator Griffith, final supplementary question. Uh, Minister, the COAG Energy Council is the forum for the Commonwealth and the states to work together on energy policy, and it met six times in 2018, but it has not met yet in 2019, which is quite a big concern. Now, can you explain why the Energy Council has not met this year and why the government is not making greater use of this forum to manage the risks facing South Australia? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, the COAG Energy Council uh, will, I understand, meet on uh, November 22. Uh, and although it hasn't physically met recently, it has continued to pursue work, including out-of-session work, during, uh, during the course of this year. Uh, the government's new retailer reliability obligation uh, was agreed by ministers of the COAG Energy Council uh, out of session in May of this year, uh, so the government could implement this key election policy uh, effective from 1 July, uh, a retailer reliability obligation that is now triggered in relation to uh, aspects of the Victorian energy market uh, and helping to ensure that supply can meet demand in Victoria uh, over the coming summer. Uh, the Council continues to work on key other issues out of session. Uh, the Department convening a general business meeting of senior committee officials on 2 August 2019, uh, helping to inform the discussions that will occur uh, on November 22, focused they will be on affordability and reliability as our government is Order. at every step Senator of the way. Birmingham. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. 
The devastating interim report in, of the Royal Commission into Aged Care, Quality and Safety has confirmed the shameful neglect of older Australians. Today we see analysis that about 50,000 older Australians across the country are at risk as a result of an unacceptably high uh, risk of insolvency of at least 200 residential aged care providers. Will the minister take responsibility for fixing Australia's broken aged care system? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, uh, the government uh, has taken significant efforts over recent times to repair the aged care system. And, Mr. President, uh, one of the actions that we took in relation to dealing with the circumstances that occur in the aged care sector is to call the Royal Commission. Uh, and that Royal Commission, Mr. President, uh, made, said a number of things. Uh, it, it laid open the circumstance of aged care in this country. It put Australia on notice. It put the Australian government on notice. It put uh, the Australian aged care sector on notice, and it put the aged care industry on notice Order. about the circumstance in aged care and made some recommendations, Mr. President, in respect of what needed to be done to repair that. The government said, in response to the report when it was released last week, that we would take some action, particularly in the areas that were recommended by the Royal Commission. It, it made three key elements uh, that it wanted to see done. It wanted to see some acti action with respect to home care packages, and the Prime Minister has said that we will make some statements about that prior to Christmas, and the government will do that. Uh, it also said, Mr President, that it wanted to see some work done with respect to young people in aged care, uh, and that work has already commenced, and we will take further action in that place, as I have said and as the government said. It also said, Mr President, that we wanted to uh, do some work with respect to uh, the use of restraints. And the government has said we will take some action to deal with that. So, Mr President, the Aged Care Royal Commission report said that the issues in aged care were historical over a number of governments, not just this government, but a number of governments. Order. And we all need to take responsibility for it. And Mr President, the government will take action to repair the aged care Order, sector. Senator Colbeck. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. I note the minister mentioned taking action by Christmas, so let me ask. The Royal Commission's interim report recommended as one of three urgent actions an immediate injection of more government funds into home care services. In addition, Leading Age Service now argues that an urgent pre-Christmas injection into residential aged care is also required. What urgent support will the Morrison government give the aged care sector prior to Christmas? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr President, the government will do what it said it would do when the Royal Commission report was released uh, a week before last. Uh, it will consider the report carefully uh, and it will Order. take action, particularly with respect to home care places. And the Prime Minister has said quite clearly that we'll, we will make additional investment into the, uh, the home care sector. Uh, and I've also said that we will also look at reforming the home care sector, because that's what the Royal Commission report said we should do. So we will be doing order. what we Senator, said we would Senator do, Senator which Colbeck, is to make I have Senator Keneally on a point sector. of order. Senator Keneally. Direct relevance. The minister has been speaking for 30 seconds. He has less than that time left. The question was very specific. What urgent support will be delivered before Christmas? Either he can answer it or he can't. He hasn't done that yet. Um, I, I, I think I'm listening very carefully to the minister's answer. Um, I, you have restated the end of the question. I believe the minister is talking about the issues that are directly relevant to the question. I can't instruct him how to answer a question, but he is specifically talking about the issue. One of the issues you supported, uh, you, you raised. There is an opportunity after question time to debate the merits of a minister's answer. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as, I, as I was saying, we have said quite clearly that we will make additional investment into the aged care sector prior to Christmas. Uh, we will make some specific announcements uh, in uh, alignment with my EFO uh, after we've been through our proper process of government. That's what we will do. And th uh, Thank you, Mr President. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Thank you. I note the minister said there will be announcements before Christmas. We will watch 
Chief Executive of Leading Age Services Australia, Sean Rooney, says that, and I quote, if there is no action from the government on this, there is a risk of missed care and the threat of service failure and closure. After six years in government, when will the coalition finally take action to fix a broken aged care system that's leaving older Australians at risk? Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr. President, uh, we are clearly taking action, uh, and the calling of the Royal Commission Order. was a part of that process. Because what we wanted was an industry-wide inspection left. of the aged care sector so that they could then come back to us and make recommendations to us on how the aged care sector should look in the future. If Senator Keneally had read the report, she would see in the report that it calls for action in three areas, which we've said we will, in the, we will take, but it also says it doesn't want to be working uh, and working on a moving target. So it cautions about what actions we take in what areas as part of our processes moving forward. But, Mr. President, Order. we have already taken significant On my actions. Left. What, we've, Order. what we've taken already is new aged care regulations, new regulations on Order. restraint, new uh, resident facing. Order, Senator Colbeck. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Macdonald. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Natural Disasters and Emergency Management, Senator Mackenzie. Can the Minister please provide an update on the bushfires in New South Wales and Queensland? The Minister for Natural Disaster and Emergency Management, sorry, the Minister representing the Minister for Natural Disaster and Emergency Management, Senator Mackenzie. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Macdonald, for your question. I know we're all very concerned here today about the devastating bushfires burning across New South Wales and Queensland. Our first concern is for safety and well-being of those directly affected. And like Senator Reynolds, I would also like to pay tribute to our emergency service workers, the RFS, the SES who risked their lives to protect others, and of course to those who have lost loved ones and home. As of 1 p.m. Uh, today, all fires nationwide are burning at the watch and act level or below. Catastrophic fire danger conditions are forecast for parts of New South Wales, including the Greater Hunter, Greater Sydney and Illawarra Shoalhaven for today. This is the first time since the new fire danger ratings were introduced in 2009 that catastrophic fire danger has been forecast for Sydney. Very high to severe fire dangers continue on Wednesday the 13th over northeast New South Wales and southeast Queensland, with a risk of dry lightning exacerbating the danger. The southwesterly change moves through southeast Queensland and severe fire dangers are forecast for southeast Queensland and the northern tablelands of New South Wales. Very high fire dangers are forecast elsewhere over central and northeast New South Wales. Unfortunately, no rainfall is expected for the northeast of New South Wales and southeast Queensland over the next seven days. As we know, tragically, three people have lost their lives, and our thoughts are with their families and loved ones at this difficult time. More than 30 people have been injured, including around 20 firefighters. The New South Wales fire fire fires have had a devastating impact on many affected communities, with 150 structures destroyed, 96 confirmed. Other property damage includes telecommunications, power infrastructure, bridges and two schools. Evacuation centres have been established to support fire-affected communities. And commencing uh, yesterday, the New South Wales Premier declared a state of emergency for the whole state for seven days. More than 1,300 firefighters and support personnel, Order. along with 93 Senator aircraft, McKenzie. have been Senator McDonald, a supplementary question. Can the minister outline to the Senate the types of assistance that's available to those impacted? Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, fires continue to threaten lives and properties overnight, particularly uh, on the Sunshine Coast and at Cobra Ball, where, uh, west of Yapoon, quite close to where Senator Canavan lives, and uh, Lou O'Brien's election near, Luke, uh, near Noosa. Disaster recovery assistance is now being provided under the disaster recovery funding arrangements that we have with the states in response to New South Wales. That assistance is available for the mid-north coast bushfires for local governments in Coffs Harbour, Kempsey, Midcoast, Nambucca, Port Macquarie and Hastings, the northern New South Wales bushfires, Armidale, Clarence Valley, Gleninas, Walker, 
a range of assistance, including support for people suffering personal hardship, concessional interest rate loans, freight subsidies for primary producers, grants to eligible non-for-profit organisations, support for affected local councils, and funding to cover counter-disaster operation costs, including firefighting activities. This assistance is administered by the New South Wales government, and anyone in need can contact Order. the government. Senator McKenzie. Senator Macdonald, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise how Australians can best prepare themselves for the current bushfire situation and into the future? Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you, Senator Macdonald. Uh, Queensland also uh, is recipient of the DRFA response, uh, and they'll be able to contact the Queensland government, who will be administering that. In terms of being prepared for the situation such as these devastating fire, it requires collaboration between all uh, levels of government. Australians know the importance of preparing for the bushfire season, especially those who live in or near bushland. And our farmers, in particular, are very uh, aware of having bushfire plans in place. But I think these fires have shown that it is just not those that live in and around bushland that need to ensure they've got an active fire plan in, uh, in place. Practically speaking, anyone who lives in a high-risk area uh, needs to have that bushfire plan in place. Place. That means clearing vegetation around buildings and fences, uh, clearing your driveways, your gutterings, etc. Some advice is to turn off electric fences and always uh, pay attention to the emergency service providers and act and leave uh, when they give you that advice. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Senator representing the Attorney General. Apparently, nearly 2,400 people have direct access to Parliament House with a sponsored security pass. Getting one of these so-called orange passes is a huge win for lobbyists. It lets them wander, wander around the halls of Parliament House without an escort. It gives them a chance to bump into ministers at Aussie's Cafe or drop in to see MPs or senators in their offices. But Australians, much to their disgrace, are in the dark about who these orange pass holders are, whose interests they represent and what they're actually doing here. Why can't, why can't they know, the people of Australia know the details of who they are, why is there no transparency over who has direct access to federal politicians inside Parliament House? Minister representing the Attorney General, Senator Payne. Do you want that, Mr. President? Do you want that? Um, <laughs> Senator, Senator Lambie, thank you very much for your question. Uh, my understanding is uh, such matters as uh, access to Parliament House and the issuing of passes. It's a matter for the Department of Parliamentary Services which is, of course, administered by the President and the Speaker. Uh, if the President uh, wishes to uh, provide a response uh, in me via me taking this on notice or wishes to provide a response now, Mr President, of course, uh, then I would <laughs> defer entirely to the President, Senator Lambie. I, I won't take up question time by adding now it has been covered in estimates. There is an estimate spillover where I could be quizzed later this week, Senator Lambie, or you're also, of course, at liberty to quiz me in the chamber at any point as well. But I won't take up any more question time by adding to what I've said on the record <laughs> yet. Um, there are the opportunities for you to ask myself on behalf of the Parliamentary Services Department in the future. But I'll call you to ask a supplementary question if you wish. So I have to be honest, Mr President, it shouldn't be that difficult. I mean, we have just under 600 people on the lobbyist register, uh, and I'm sure you've noticed that. That means there's 800 lobbyists that are slipping under the radar. So does MOPS or yourself intend to do something about this in the future and actually change the regulations so they're up to scratch? I mean, even New Zealand has nothing to fear and they're doing it. So if the Kiwis can do it, I just would like to know why we can't be honest to the Australian people and show them who's on the list. Mm -hmm. um, if the Senate's happy, I can take this as a supplementary question to myself. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, if he's leave granted. Um, Senator Lambie, there's I'm happy to forward to your office um, lengthy discussions and hand out on this to provide the context. But in the end, the lobbyist register is not the same as the register for sponsored passes. There is some crossover. The lobbyist register, which is administered by the government, not by the Department of Parliamentary Services, as has been the subject of debate, refers to lobbyists who lobby on behalf of paid clients. The sponsored passes include people who are representing community groups and other uh, NGOs, people who are not paid lobbyists, nor are they necessarily lobbyists in the employ of a single firm, as you know, government affairs managers and the like. I'm happy to provide you with the hand start of the previous discussion before Thursday, so you have an opportunity to quiz me at the estimate spillover if you wish, or to raise it again in the chamber. 
Oh, Senator Payne. I may by leave very briefly in response to Senator Lambie's question. I recognise this is unorthodox, but uh, if there is further information that the Attorney General is able to provide in relation to your question as it relates to the register, uh, then I will take that on notice and seek to uh, obtain a response from the Attorney General. Um, do you have a final supplementary, Senator Lambie? Thank you, Mr. President. I think um, I think everyone needs to realise here that Australians know there's pretty shady stuff going on up here when it comes to lobbyists and these passes, and it's about time, in the name of democracy in this country, we were open and honest of who was getting these passes, exactly what they were doing up here, and honestly, the only the the only people. Uh, and what bothers Australians more than anything is how many of these lobbyists are coming in and actually giving out political donations at the same time, and that's where the problem is. Order. Um, I, I'm, I don't have anything to add to what I said earlier, Senator Lambie. I'm happy to provide the information on notice, and you can pursue it with me publicly here or in the committee or privately. Senator Payne, you don't have anything further to add? I will then move to Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. Prior to the election, uh, Sports Australia CEO Kate Palmer twice stated that Senator Mackenzie, as Sports Minister, had only awarded community sports infrastructure grants to projects recommended by Sports Australia. <coughs> then, only three days before the election, Ms Palmer changed her position, stating, some projects from the eligible pool of applicants that were preferred by the minister were approved by her. How many, how many times did Senator Mackenzie approve taxpayer money for her personally preferred projects against the recommendation of Sports Australia? The minister, order. the minister, order on my left. I will call the minister when I can hear him. The Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Mr. President. Order, Senator Watt. Mr. President, the government invested uh, $102.5 million in the Community Sport Infrastructure Grant program and delivered 648 projects. Building better sporting facilities for healthier and stronger communities by promoting physical activity and social connection. These grants are enabling people from right across the country to get more active Order. more often. Projects include upgrades to female change room facilities, lighting upgrades for local sporting clubs and surface upgrades to ensure a safer and sporting environment. Mr President, over 2,050 applications totalling nearly $400 million were made to the program, which has seen 224 projects funded as round, part of round one, 232 projects Founded as order. part of Senator round two. Colbeck, um, Senator Farrell on a point of order. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Mr President, uh, it's uh, in relation to uh, relevance. Um, <clears throat> we've uh, heard about all of these projects the government uh, is uh, um, uh, funding, but my question was quite, specifically, uh, quite specific. How many times did Senator Mackenzie approve taxpayer money uh, for projects against the recommendations of Sports Australia. I don't want to know which projects the government supported. I want to know the ones they rejected against the evidence and advice of Sports um, Australia. I, I accept the, the sub order. I'll make a ruling when there's silence. I will, we, we're using up time in question time with noise on my left. Is there going to be silence to allow me to make a ruling? On, on the point of order, I accept the substance of the question was about ministerial action um, and ministerial decision, not the program generally. I'm listening carefully to the minister, who has 57 seconds remaining to answer. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. As I said, there were 232 projects funded as part of round two and 228 projects funded as part of round three. Mr President, each application was individually assessed using criteria including community participation, community need and project design and delivery. Recommendations were then provided to the Minister for Sport, who was the grant delegate for final decision and approval. 
Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I do have a further uh, supplementary question. Over three rounds of this program, 684 successful applications have been awarded funding, according to the Sports Australia website. How many of these 684 successful applicants were personally selected by Senator Mackenzie against the advice of Sports Australia, and on what basis were those decisions made? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, as I've just said, uh, Senator Mackenzie, as the then minister, was the delegate responsible for approving every project. That was her role. That was her responsibility. Order. And so, Mr. President, Minister Mackenzie was responsible for approving every single project, uh, each one of which, Mr. President, met the guidelines of the program. So it's it's really quite simple, Mr. President. There were over 2,000 applications, totaling nearly 400 million dollars. The project program was very, very popular, very popular, to the extent that we ran three rounds of the program uh, before the election. And Minister Mackenzie, as the responsible delegate, made the decisions on which projects were approved. Senator Farrell, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. I do have one. Uh, in evidence before Senate estimates, it was revealed that 618 recommended applications were rejected by Senator Mackenzie. How many of these 618 eligible grassroots projects would have received local funding if Senator Mackenzie had not intervened and handpicked her favourites? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, uh, as I've said <coughs> in answers to previous questions, Minister Mackenzie, as the delegate, was responsible for the final approval of every project in the program. Uh, the 224 projects that were funded as part of round one, the 232 projects that were funded as part of round two, and the 228 projects order. that Senator were funded Farrell, as on a part of round one. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, again, relevant. So we're not asking about which uh, program Senator Mackenzie approved. We're asking about which. Uh, projects, she rejected the advice of Sports Australia, her department. Senator Farrell, I, I think with respect, you're going to um, how the minister is answering the question. Um, there's an opportunity for debating that after question time, but by talking about the approval process, which may or may not meet with your uh, uh, approval or wish, I think he is, however, being directly relevant. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. As I've said, every project that was funded under this program was eligible for funding under the guidelines. Minister Mackenzie, as the responsible minister, uh, had the final say and responsibility with respect to the approval of the projects under each round of the program. Senator Stoker. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the minister please update the Senate on recent international consultations about countering terrorism? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Stoker for her question. But, Mr. President, last week Australia hosted the second No Money for Terror uh, international conference, and I want to acknowledge and thank France for their leadership in convening the first of the No Money for Terror conferences in 2018, uh, and indeed acknowledge India for offering to host next year's conference. Uh, I also want to acknowledge Mr Dutton and Home Affairs for their work in convening the Melbourne meeting. The goal of these conferences uh, Mr. President, is to work across international boundaries to close loopholes for terrorist financing. We had some 81 delegations attending the Melbourne meeting, representing 67 countries and jurisdictions, as well as 14 international organisations, and almost 20 of those delegations were led by ministers or minister equivalents. Uh, both the Minister for Home Affairs, the Attorney General and I ran sessions during the conference, which are important opportunities for Australia to engage and lead on these issues. We discussed the international and the regional threat environment. Uh, global responses to kidnap for terrorism for ransom I'm sorry and the effect of emerging technologies on terrorism financing risks we also considered how we can enhance public private partnerships uh, in the context of the no money for terror theme mr. president because the engagement of the private sector is obviously pivotal uh, in terms of the movement of money and how we can take a collective security approach to preventing the exploitation of not-for-profit organizations for terrorism purposes. Indeed, the private sector was well represented on the second day of the, uh, of the event in recognition of the fact that in countering terrorism, 
uh, and making sure our civil society organisations are not exploited by terrorists. It has to be a whole of community undertaking. We know that governments can't defeat terrorism nor their support networks by acting alone. Uh, we need a whole of society approach if we're to achieve collective security, and that was the approach taken uh, during the No Money for Terror conference. Senator Stoker, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister please advise of what particular concerns Australia has about the way that terrorists fund their operations? Senator Payne. Mr President, as part of our commitment to combating terrorism, the Australian government has a long-standing policy across governments that it does not pay ransoms. Daesh accrued up to $45 million US from kidnappings between September 2013 and September 2014 alone. Kidnapping contributed about US $89 million into the Al-Qaeda war chest between 2013 and 2017. It's important to note that as ransom has been paid more frequently, so the ransom price has gone up. In the early 2000s, we saw payment demanded for hostages in the tens of thousands of dollars. Now it's as much as $5 million per case. Kidnap for ransom, unfortunately, is a, in, an important and a reliable literal revenue stream for terrorist groups, which we are determined to disrupt. Uh, in the uh, Kidnap for Ransom section, both the French Foreign Minister Jean-Yves Le Drian, the New Zealand Justice Minister Andrew Little and the UNCTD um, Director Payne. Michelle Connix contributed. Time the answer expired. Senator Stoker, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise on the future steps to take towards countering terrorism? Senator Payne. Just briefly, Mr. President, I can advise that uh, in, in 2019, the UN, the G20, the ASEAN Regional Forum have all sought to focus attention on the link between ransoms and terrorism. In fact, UN Security Council Resolution 2133 specifically calls on, and I quote, member states to prevent terrorists from benefiting directly or indirectly from ransom payments or political concessions to secure the safe relief of hostages, release of hostages. Um, Mr. President, they the UN Security Council resolution gives a foundation uh, upon which uh, actions from the No Money for Terror conference can be pursued, and we will continue to work with other countries towards a common approach to kidnap for ransom. Yeah. Senator Gallagher. Yeah. To the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. In an article in yesterday's Australian Financial Review entitled First Home Buyer Risk Rivals Banks, it is revealed that big banks want to charge higher interest rates under the Morrison government's first home, first home Loan Deposit Scheme. Can the government guarantee that borrowers who use the First Home Loan Deposit Scheme will not be charged a higher rate of interest? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. <coughs> Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr President. Uh, I can uh, reassure Senator Gallagher that loan pricing is a key evaluation criteria the national Housing, Finance and Investment Corporation will consider in selecting the scheme's panel of lenders. A number of lenders, including small lenders, have already indicated through the market sounding process they are prepared to offer products under the scheme that do not charge first home buyers more, and that is what uh, we want to see. Uh, in approving lenders for participation in the scheme, uh, the National Housing, Finance and Investment Corporation will assess impacts on competition as well as the attractiveness of each lender's loan products in terms of interest rates and fees. Uh, lenders participating in the scheme will co continue to be subject uh, to existing uh, responsible lending obligations, including ensuring that loans are only extended to borrowers that can comfortably service that loan. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. How will these measures um, that the government undertake actually ensure that no user is charged a higher rate of interest? Senator Cormann. Uh, well, I've, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I've just uh, provided uh, that um, information to uh, Senator Gallagher. I mean, the uh, first home loan deposit scheme is administered through the National Housing Finance Investment Corporation, uh, which, uh, of course, has gone through a, a market-sounding process, and it's very clear uh, from that process uh, that, uh, in that, that there are uh, offers available, uh, product offers available under the scheme that do not charge first home buyers more, which is what we want to see. Uh, I would also, of course, 
um, uh, make the point uh, that um, the government uh, made a commitment in the lead up to the election to this scheme, which we're now uh, delivering. The scheme is to be administered, as I've indicated, through the National Housing Finance Investment Corporation, which will partner with uh, lenders to deliver the scheme. Um, the NHFIC has commenced the procurement process to establish an initial panel of lenders. The panel will have no more than two of the four major banks and is designed to meet the government's expectations that smaller lenders will play a significant role in Order, the scheme Senator to facilitate Corman. competition. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. President. The article also reveals that big banks have queried whether the government scheme will be up and running by the promised start date of January 1. Can the government guarantee that the scheme will be fully operational by the 1st of January 2020? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. The government remains indeed on track to make the scheme available from 1 January 2020. Senator Antic. Oh, oh Senator no, no, Antic. Oh. <laughs> Sorry? Sorry, Senator Wong. Order Chair, I think, I think the time has expired. It was uh, 2.08 we started. Senator Cormann. Oh, sorry, Senator Wong, it was 2.08, it was my note. I'm looking at the clerk, who I think agrees. Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr President. This is a ripping question, so I thank you for that. My question is to the Minister for Resources and Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. Can the Minister please update the Senate on any recent developments on the site selection process for a national radioactive waste management facility? That is a ripping question. Minister for Resources in Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much, um, Mr President. I thank uh, Senator Antich for his question. He would know, coming from South Australia, that the government is considering a number of sites in South Australia for the location of a national radioactive waste facility uh, uh, to store our, our waste. We've been trying to find a long-term uh, place to store this waste for about 40 years. It's extremely important because the waste that it will store comes from production of, primarily from the production of nuclear medicines that we make at Lucas Heights near Sydney. Now, nuclear medicines has allowed us to control in some cases, can cure conditions like cancer, related thyroid conditions, bone pain caused by cancer, and many other medical conditions. In fact, on average, around one in two Australians will require the use of nuclear medicines during their lifetime. So it's very important that we manage and store this waste appropriately. Currently, our radioactive waste is spread across about 100 storage facilities. It is envisaged that a national radioactive waste management facility will consolidate this waste into a single safe location. So, as I said. We are looking at three different proposed sites in uh, South Australia, two in near the town of Kimber and one near the town of Hawker. Just last week, a ballot was finalised in the community of Kimber on whether they would like their community to, to host such a facility. Uh, and I, I, it's welcome news to report that over 90 per cent of people in that community voted. It was, it was a voluntary vote. Um, and around 61.5 per cent of residents supported a facility located in their, in their community. Now, this is just one piece of information the government will consider before making a decision uh, on any facility. There is another ballot due to occur in the Hawker region that's open this week and will be concluded before the end of Christmas. But I welcome that level of community support and I particularly thank the entire community of Kimber and also those in the Hawker region as well for their patience and resilience through this process as we try to find a place to store the, life sa the waste from the production of life-saving medicines Canavan. for all Australians. Senator Antic, a supplementary question. Thank you. How is the federal government supporting communities where the site of this facility is being considered? Senator Canavan. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And, um, uh, Mr. President, can I say up front that uh, it's been a privilege for me to visit these communities multiple times through this process. They are both Kimber and Hawker are fantastic towns. Um, it's been great to get to know the, the leaders of those communities and many others in, the, in their community. Uh, and we have tried to support these towns through this process. I said it has gone on a while, and through that period we have invested already $5.76 million across 57 projects across Kimber and the Flinders Ranges region to help their community grow and develop and meet their broader goals. Uh, additionally, I've announced a further four, the government has announced a further $4 million uh, to provide additional community support uh, because the vote took a little bit longer to get to because of a court case. And 
uh, Mr. President, if we are to proceed with a facility, we will we'll invest $31 million in, in that community to help them upskill to take the best advantage of this facility, which will provide 45 local jobs and lots of benefits to small businesses. We very much hope to partner with the community to help them grow and develop, as well as help solve a national issue for our entire country. Senator Antic, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, what are the benefits of the National Radioactive Waste Management Facility for the community which decides to host it? Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Again, as I said um, before in, in the question earlier, there are some direct benefits uh, for the community. Uh, it will be a facility that uh, requires 45 jobs. About 20 to 25 of those jobs will not require any uh, skills. They will be on the job trained, so that will be open, obviously, to most people in any town or community. We are also putting on the table $8 million to help upskill people in the community to train ahead of the uh, any construction or operation of a facility to fill the, the more skilled jobs as well, to bring skilled jobs to a local rural town. And one thing I'm very excited about, Mr President, is if we are to proceed with a facility at one of these communities, it will link a small country town in South Australia with our world-class nuclear medicine supply chain. Uh, we have already hosted students uh, and community members at Lucas Heights from both of these communities, and if we maintain that relationship over a long period of time, uh, that will help young people in these towns uh, be, have, be exposed to a world-class industry and maybe pique their interest in going on to contribute to what is an amazing industry that we're lucky to have in this country. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. And I also seek leave to move a motion relating to the routine of business for the remainder of today. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. I Senator Cormann. <coughs> I move the motion circulated in my name. The question is that motion be agreed to. Oh, sorry. Leave was granted. I've put, I'm, put, I'm going to put the motion. The question is the motion moved by Senator Cormann be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Motions to take note of answers, Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I oh, rise to take pardon, Senator Keneally. Sorry, sorry, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. I took a couple of things on notice yesterday, so I'd just like to inform the Senate. Um, so, in response to Senator Green regarding the reallocation of RGIP funds in tropical North Queensland, my advice is the Department of Industry, Innovation and Science's Business Grants Hub provided the Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Cities and Regional Development with the eligibility and merit assessment for each application. The Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Cities and Regional Development provide its recommendation to the ministerial panel based on the merit assessments. The ministerial panel considered the recommendations and made its funding decisions. The Labor Party claimed there is no electoral bias and asked the ANAO to look into that specific issue. The ANAO did specifically look at that issue and concluded there was no electoral bias evident in the assessment and decision-making process concerning funding of projects in RGIP regions. Far North Queensland was not shortchanged. The government recommitted uh, funding to other key priority projects in the region, including the Habitat Dome and the Skyrail tourism projects. Um, which the former Leader of the Opposition uh, visited during the ex uh, election campaign. Uh, in response to a question asked by Senator Urquhart regarding the CAFE project on Flinders Island, Tasmania, I'm advised that the reason for the co-funding exemption application was the limited capacity of this not-for-profit organisation to contribute cash funding to the project. The ministerial panel approved the original application for the cafe and other amenities. I understand the proponent, the Flinders Island Tourism and Business Incorporated, sought a change of scope to the project, as the original concept of a permanent facility was not able to proceed as the site was sold prior to funding approval and they had not been able to secure a replacement site. The request was made to each of the components, cafe and commercial kitchen accommodation and community centre individual semi-permanent movable units, which could then be loaded onto a truck to be transported to island events when and where required. The grant recipient was also requested to add an amenities component to the project. The units would allow for maximum flexibility to service the needs of individual events and assist in addressing a major inhibitor for growth at these events on the island. The units would supplement the facilities at the Flinders Island Food and Crayfish Festival 
and the Ferno Island Festival, Music in the Vines, etc. etc. Letters of support from the communities were provided to support the rescoped project. The Department of Industry, Innovation and Science's Oz Industry Grants Hub assessed the rescoped project in terms of job outcomes, costs and impacts on other business in the regions and approved the change in scope. And finally, I took, uh, took on behalf of Minister Littleproud a question from Senator Walsh yesterday around Moira Shire. Uh, and my advice is that last week the government announced that a further $1 million would be provided to 122 councils which have previously received funding under the DCP extension, as well as a $1 million for six new councils. The six new councils all met the rainfall deficiency and agricultural employment reliance criteria at the end of September as part of the normal quarterly update. The government has announced a review of the DCP and is expecting the outcomes of that review before January. A range of information will be considered and that will inform the government's uh, the $50 million that was announced by the government last week on how that can support projects in drought affected LGAs across the country. And any additional councils will be announced after the review is completed. The member for Nichols asked the Minister for Drought to consider uh, exercising his discretionary powers under the guidelines. The member for Nichols' office was advised the Minister for Drought was considering his request. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And uh, I had called Senator Keneally to take note of answers. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Cormann to the question asked by Senator Wong. Yesterday, the Commissioner of the New South Wales Rural Fire Services, Shane Fitzsimmons, said that we are currently facing, quote, the most dangerous bushfire week this nation has ever seen. As of this afternoon, there are over 70 fires raging across the state of New South Wales. Forty of those fires are uncontained. Ten are at emergency levels. Ten fires are at the watch and act level. Over 600 schools are closed, and nine have had to be evacuated. We know the conditions this evening have the potential to turn worse than they currently are and can develop rapidly. For the first time in our history, a catastrophic fire warning has been issued for the greater Sydney area as well as the greater Hunter, Illawarra and Shoalhaven regions. This represents an extraordinary threat to life and property. Many more fires are threatening communities in Queensland and South Australia. Madam Deputy President, bushfires are cruel. They are a force of nature that indiscriminately takes life and property. With them, they take part of our nation's soul. The tragic 1993 and 1994 bushfires that impacted communities across the eastern seaboard happened before I moved permanently to Australia. My now husband, Ben, was visiting me in the United States as we followed the news, particularly of his family being involved in taking in people who had to evacuate their homes. In January 1994, Sydney was threatened with the total isolation due to these fires. Those 1994 bushfires destroyed 80,000 hectares of bushland along with 225 homes. They took four lives. They changed Sydney and they changed New South Wales. The events of 1994 were one of the catalysts in forming today's modern rural fire service the same RFS that is bravely battling on the ground today, protecting people and property. And yet, since the start of this year's bushfire season, a million hectares have been raised across New South Wales, surpassing that of the horrifying events of 1994. The devastation inflicted by bushfires is senseless, along with the way that they impact the lives of our fellow Australians. Since Friday, we know that three people have lost their lives in New South Wales. This is an irreconcilable and incomprehensible loss. Given some of the commentary earlier today by the member for New England, I would like to respectfully pay my tributes to these three Australian New South Wales citizens and pay my respects and send my sorrow to their families. Of these three people, I speak specifically of George Knoll, Julie Fletcher and Vivian Chaplin, who have lost their lives in these fires. More than 150 homes have been destroyed, but we will not be able to comprehend the full scope of this disaster for some time. Labor extends our sincere sympathies to those who have lost loved ones, livestock, pets and property. 
Our thoughts are with you at this time, and we stand ready to work alongside the government and affected communities to help in any way we can. I would also like to pay tribute to our incredible emergency personnel and volunteers who are currently battling these fires across the eastern seaboard. More than 3,000 firefighters have either been deployed across New South Wales today to fight the, have been deployed across New South Wales today to fight these fires and prevent further loss of life. As the former Premier of New South Wales and as a member of that parliament for nearly 10 years, I've been honored to see our emergency services and volunteers up close. Whether it be during times of flood or bushfire, they are highly skilled, dedicated and courageous. They typify the Australian spirit of helping out one another in a time of need. That Australian spirit is on display right now in the most harrowing of conditions. Professional firefighters and volunteers working alongside local community members and Defence Force personnel. We know bushfires don't respect borders, and we thank those people who've travelled from interstate to fight the fires in New South Wales. The footage we've seen is truly terrifying and only serves to underline the extraordinary bravery being demonstrated every moment by those who are risking their lives to protect people, homes and communities. So I urge everyone who's affect, in areas affected by fires, including in my hometown of Sydney, please remain vi village, vigilant, listen to warnings, download the Royal Fire Service, Service Fires Near Me Thank app you, and Senator stay Keneally, safe. Your time has expired. Senator Betts. Fire is a friend and a foe. Of late, fire is being an absolute foe, destroying property, livestock, habitat and, most tragically, human lives. Decent Australians' thoughts and prayers are with the victims and their families, those in the thick of it and the selfless frontline workers valiantly fighting the fires, seeking to protect lives, property and habitat. We do face a bushfire emergency. Regrettably, it's nothing new in Australia. And in recognising the commentary from Senator Keneally, yes, it is true that it is the first time ever that it's been labelled as catastrophic. The reason being that we've got a new fire level uh, management system that has introduced the term catastrophic, and that was introduced in 2009. So let's get a sense of proportion and not seek to play politics with this. Let's actually understand that a new regime has been introduced which uses the term catastrophic which was introduced in 2009, because whilst one million acres, I think, or hectares, I'm not sure which uh, the good senator referred to as having been burnt out, and undoubtedly much, much more, a million acres, and I did a rough calculation, I hope I'm right, is about uh, 4,000 square kilometres. The Black Saturday fires in Victoria in 2009 burnt 4,500 square kilometres. Twenty-six years earlier, the Ash Wednesday fire in Victoria, South Australia, burnt 5,200 square kilometres. Sixteen years before that, in my home state of Tasmania, 2,600 square kilometres were burnt out. Before that, by 28 years, in 1939, 20,000 square kilometres were burnt out. And so you can go back in history, especially back to the 1850s, where huge fires devastated um, our country. The Royal Commission into the Victorian bushfires in 1939 said that for more than 20 years the state of Victoria had not seen its countryside and forests in such travail. Creeks and springs ceased to run. So this was in 1939, 20 years prior, that means starting from 1919. We also know that from 1895 to about 1903, thereabouts, there was an eight-year federation drought that saw the mighty Murray stop running. 
We've got to understand that this is a country of droughts and flooding rains, as Dorothy McKellar told us so poignantly in her poem, I Love a Sunburnt Country. And so as our fellow Australians fight fires, seeking to protect life, limb, property, livestock, native wildlife, let's just be mindful of the task that they are facing. Remember them in our thoughts and prayers. Give them all the support that we possibly can in these most difficult times, and let's not seek in any way, shape or form to play a game that might be seen as taking an opportunistic approach to this very, very serious issue. Fires are an absolute foe and menace to us in the Australian landscape, especially when fuel loads are allowed to build up and build up. We know that that is a lesson that we learned from the Australian habitat. Our Indigenous uh, people ensured that fuel loads were in fact relatively low around the countryside, but nevertheless massive landscape bushfires devastated my home state of Tasmania about the time of white settlement. 1967, major fire. 1934, a major fire. And so the list goes on. Let's not play politics with fire. Let's give every support to the men and women who are fighting them and are fearing for their life Thank and their property. Thank you, Senator Betts. Your time has expired. Senator Ayres. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I rise also to take note of the, uh, the answer given by Senator Cormann to Senator Wong's question in relation to the fires uh, across the country, in particular uh, in New South Wales and Queensland. The Rural Fire Service Deputy Commissioner in New South Wales, Rob Rogers, said that the situation was unprecedented uh, and worse than he could have imagined uh, earlier today. More than 3,000 firefighters are currently deployed in New South Wales, supported by 60 aircraft. The response of the State government in New South Wales is at a scale uh, that has not been seen before. More than 600 schools will be closed across New South Wales uh, today, uh, and additional schools, I'm advised, are being closed uh, throughout the course of the day as fires threaten them. There are 55 fires burning uh, through New South Wales. 30 of those are uncontained. Seven are at emergency level. Uh, eight at Watch and Act. Uh, there, are, there are very significant fires in particular, while there are fires from the Queensland border through to the Bega Valley. The most significant fires in New South Wales at this stage are in uh, the New England and on the mid-north coast and far north coast of New South Wales. Uh, in that country, particularly in northern New South Wales, there are many townships uh, and many farms. Uh, on the coastal hinterland, there are retirees and families living on small bush blocks, uh, all at enormous risk uh, today uh, and, uh, and over the course of last week. Uh, and I know that the thoughts of everybody in this place uh, are with uh, those people. I spoke to uh, Paul Secvi. Who, uh, whose property was destroyed uh, over the course of Friday. Uh, he said, uh, the, all, all, I should say, all of the adjoining properties in his area were destroyed. Uh, his shed was destroyed. He returned home to a house uh, that will be uninhabitable uh, to a note from the Rural Fire Service that said, we're really glad we could save your house. I'm sorry about your shed. Uh, I spoke to the Mayor of Glen Innes, Carol Sparks, yesterday. I rang her for two reasons. One was because I think right now it's the job of people in this place to listen and learn, uh, and certainly the Mayor of Glen Innes was forthright in her views about what Canberra and politicians should be doing. But secondly, it's the country that I grew up in. Uh, I know it very well. Uh, the 
Uh, countryside, particularly the state forests and national park, are densely wooded. They are dry. They have never been drier. Uh, it is very difficult to defend uh, properties and to defend those small townships uh, in that circumstance. Uh, and the three people who were killed last week, George Cole, Vivian Fletcher at the fire in Waitalabar, uh, and, and uh, Julie Fletcher in, um, in Johns River, uh, we do mourn their deaths. I think it's also to put on record what the Mayor of Glen Innes said to me about the people in Waitalabar who fought so hard to save not just property but the lives of their fellow residents who were ultimately killed. Now, I was astonished to hear uh, what the member for New England had to say earlier today on Sky. It's vulgar, it's crass, and it seems that there is no low that the former Deputy Prime Minister hasn't sunk to or won't sink to. What difference does it make who Australians affected by fire vote for? I don't think anyone should have any regard to that. I don't actually think that anybody in this place should. Um, it is beneath contempt. It is a source of enormous disappointment to his constituents in New England. Um, Australians should be working together in these crises. On the, off the Labor's part, we're thinking of the people here. We want to support the emergency services, volunteer and professional. I know that people in that region in relation to one fire have been fighting that fire for 70 days in a row. They are exhausted. We want to see the full resources of government committed to making sure that they Thank are safe you, and sound and we Your keep Australians safe. Senator Van. I rise to take note uh, of answers to questions relating to drought and I will speak to the coalition government's support for drought hit communities and farmers. Madam Acting Deputy President, the coalition government Senator backs Van. Um, we're taking note of answers um, to questions that Senator Wong asked of Senator Cormann, yes, and they no, went she to the fires. To drought. No, they went to no. fires. Okay. Thank you. Apologies, Madam Mac. That, that's Deputy fine. President. <laughs> we, we all make mistakes. Our first concern is for the safety and the needs of those directly affected. I think we'll all agree, especially in this chamber, it's in times like this that we have to work together and to look out for each other. As the Prime Minister said on his visit to the fire-affected communities in New South Wales, Australians are at their best in difficult moments like this. They show incredible spirit, heart and generosity. Our emergency services are once again showing their professionalism and dedication in the face of very difficult conditions. And I repeat advice already given today in this chamber that if people in fire-affected areas are asked to leave by the fire services or emergency services, that they should do so to look out for their family and look out for themselves to protect their lives and those of their families before looking after their properties. I would also like to add my thanks to all the career and volunteer emergency services personnel fighting these fires. I'd also like to acknowledge the comradeship on display by the contribution to the New South Wales firefighting efforts shown by interstate personnel from the Australian Capital Territory, South Australia, Tasmania and Victoria. The clear advice given by fire services, and I'd like to repeat this, to our communities is to plan ahead and to be prepared. Days like today aren't the times where you want to start that planning or start your preparations. This is, these are the days where those efforts need to be bearing fruit. Now, I'd also like to add that the Australian government stands ready to immediately assist those affected by fires in New South Wales and Queensland. The, uh, I'd like to note also that the, uh, the Defence Minister's uh, answer in question time 
that the Australian Defence Forces are coming to the aid of those fire areas. Uh, talking about the Australian Government assistance, uh, as well as the ADF forces that are being added to this, fire bombing aircraft have been in action across these fires. And our national aerial firefighting arrangements are ensuring the best possible aerial firefighting equipment is available to protect Australians. Every year, the Australian Government invests about, uh, uh, sorry, not, uh, about around $14.8 million in aerial firefighting. The Director General of Emergency Management Australia, EMA, activated the Comdis plan in, on 31 October in response to a formal request for Australian government non-financial assistance following significant fire activity in New South Wales. And this remains activated today. The Director General of, of Emergency Management Australia, uh, uh, sorry, Emergency Management Australia liaison officers have deployed to the New South Wales RFS State Operations Centre and the Queensland State Disaster Co Coordination Centre. The Australian Government is in close contact with New South Wales and Queensland authorities and stands ready to assist. Disaster recovery assistance is being provided under the DFRA, the Disaster Recovery Funding Arrangements, in response to the bushfires that have affected the mid-north coast and northern New South Wales. DRFA assistance is available for the mid-north coast bushfires in the local government areas of Coffs Harbour, Kempsey, Mid Coast, Nambucca and Port Macquarie Hastings. The northern New South Wales bushfires uh, affected are in the local government areas of Armidale, Ballingen, Clarence Valley, Glen Innes, Severn, Inverell, Richmond Valley, Tenterfield, Urala and Wiltshire. A range of assistance is available. Senator Green. Thank you. I rise to take note of the answers given by Minister Cormann to the question asked by Senator Wong. Today is a tough day for Queensland, and tomorrow will be even tougher. I want to thank Minister Cormann and Senator McKenzie for their comments today and add that the Queensland Fire and Emergency Services are responding to 55 active fires across the state. There's currently 170 crews on the ground working to keep Queenslanders safe. Some of these fires located in the southeast corner of Queensland have been burning since, since September, as they are in locations difficult to access. Twelve homes have been destroyed. The mundane to the memories, family photographs, clothes, heirlooms, pa items from pantries. Queensland Fire and Emergency Services have prepared to leave notices today to the following areas. Rosevale, Mount Alphen, Double Top, Clumba, Tarome, Adelaide Park, Kurrabal, Maryvale and Lake Mary. Residents have been told to be vigilant when it comes to air quality in Brisbane, Ipswich and the Gold Coast. Air pollution is ten times higher than usual and likely to be the same tomorrow. There are strong winds tonight and there will be more tomorrow. Complicated and challenging wind conditions will make it challenging for firefighters on the ground. So can I take this opportunity to thank the state and federal government for the response to this most recent weather event. I know in my home state we have the very best experts in emergency and disaster management and response, and we thank every emergency service personnel, firefighters, police, ambulance officers and all of their support staff. We thank those members of the emergency service personnel from other states and countries travelling to Queensland to provide support to our own brave and most likely exhausted fireys. Please stay safe. Please know your service is appreciated. I'd like to thank also the regional Queenslanders and others working in the media today to bring information and updates to Queenslanders who face unthinkable threats. We are incredibly lucky in regional Queensland to have local newsrooms and journalists dedicated to delivering stories. They bring the um, stories. 
They bring the rest of the pictures that convey the true horror of these fires that bring us the catastrophic human face of these events. Often in the line of fires themselves, we don't often thank the media in this place, but in regional Queensland, they are also part of our community, and we do thank them for their service. Over the past few days, I've heard a number of comments on what is correct to say and debate during times like these. On the one hand, we have climate change denying deniers blaming vegetation management legislation for these conditions, and on the other hand, reactions that seek to blame senators in this chamber for the direct lighting of fires themselves. I would warn both sides on this. No one comes to this debate with clean hands in politicising what is a tragic event. What people living in regional Queensland want right now, the people who are continually impacted by these disasters, is less talk and more action. Queenslanders are tough and resilient. Flood, wind, fire, we've had it all thrown our way. But when the sky turns black and the wind picks up and the smoke starts to fill the air around you, it's hard not to feel lost and hopeless. Queenslanders are stoic, but right now they are suffering. So to those people back in Queensland, I say this. The smoke will pass and the fires will burn out. The remains of your houses will be re rebuilt. But no Queenslander will do this alone, because above all else, Queenslanders stand together, today, tomorrow and always. Thank you. Senator Lambie, on this, or would you like to move your own motion about your question? On this? Uh, oh, put, no, no, no. I'll, okay, so I'll, I'll put the motion Sorry. about that question. Uh, the question is the motion uh, moved by Senator Keneally be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate take note of the answers given um, by, the, by the Minister and yourself relating to the number of parliamentary sponsored passes in circulation. Every year the number of lobbyists balloons further and further out, and every year the number of lobbyists who are registered and on the books shrinks further and further away. Don't forget either that only the registered ones are required to stick to the code of conduct. The ones who aren't registered, well, apparently they don't care, we don't care what they do. If you want to lie, that's fine. If you don't want to tell anybody who you're actually working for, that's fine too. There's not a problem there. If you want to walk in out of a minister's office, you go for it. The lobbying register needs more than a lick of paint. It needs a total makeover. It needs to be wider and it needs to be a hell of a lot tougher. It needs to be wide enough to cover everybody who's lobbying government. It needs to be tough enough to keep them on the straight and narrow. And right now, it's narrow enough to, basic, to cover basically nothing and it's weak enough to achieve basically nothing which is exactly what it's doing. The government says we can't see the list of people with sponsored passes. Think about this. There's 2,500 people with complete access to offices in the parliament. They have the, this access because a parliamentarian sponsored them. They signed a form saying they have known them for at least 12 months and they vouch for them. And we have, what do you guess, no idea who they are. We don't know who sponsored them. We don't know who they work for. We don't know how often they're coming to parliament. We don't know how many times they're coming in and out of certain offices. In fact, we have to drag it out of the government to even find out how many there are. What's going on? What, what, why the secrecy? Who's benefiting out of this? New Zealand publishes details of approved visitors who have swipe access to parliament house. Like Australian orange pass holders, New Zealand approved visitors have to show that they require regular business access to parliament to obtain a pass. New Zealand can do it. Why can't we? We're not able to cover that, apparently. All lobbyists in Canada and the US have to disclose information about their lobbying activities, whether they work for an employer or they work as a client. Both jurisdictions also have strong penalties for breaching the regulations, including fines and jail time for a deterrence. What do we have here? Under our system, the Mineral, apparently the Minerals Council aren't lobbyists. The Business Council aren't lobbyists. The Australian Council of Trade Union apparently are not lobbyists. They aren't in the building lobbying the Senate, uh, lobbying the Senate today as we speak. Whatever they're doing, apparently it's not lobbying. There must be plenty of cups of tea they're having. And get this, lobbyists who break the code can be kicked off the lobbyist register, but guess what? They never are. 
And even if they were, they can keep their sponsored pass and keep getting access to parliament unescorted, unaccounted for and basically invisible. I've been saying this for years that the solution to this problem is right under your noses. Rewrite the rules so that everyone with a sponsored orange pass is considered a lobbyist and everyone who is a lobbyist is required to sign up to the register. And everybody on it is required to abide by the lobbying code of conduct. And if you don't abide by it, you go off the register and you lose your pass. It's pretty simple. And you lose your privileged access to this parliament. Governments can only govern with the consent of the governed. If you lose the trust of the people you're trying to govern, you lose everything. This building is more than just the place of politicians hang around complaining about each other. This building is where governments are formed and governments change the country, and they only do that because we trust them, supposedly trust them to do so. We're losing the grip on that trust. My proposal says if you're a lobbyist and you break the rules, you lose your special access to parliament. If you still need to get in to see someone, sign the visitor's book like everybody else has to. You had the chance to do the right thing. You were trusted with that privilege and you abused it to benefit your own special interests, which is exactly what's going on. And then you under undermine the trust that fuels this place. You don't get to keep coming back to it. You've got to send a very clear message that the rules are rules. And it doesn't matter if you're working for unions, for big companies, for charities, or for your own business down the road. You go into a meeting with a minister you're required to play by the rules. Don't lie, don't bribe, don't threaten, don't harass. Don't corrupt the political process can you make it so you can make a dollar or two out of it. Don't do these things, because if you do, we'll come down you down on you like a ton of bricks. You'll lose more than an orange pass around your neck, I can tell you. You'll lose access and you'll lose influence. And you know what? They deserve it. The question is the motion moved by Senator Lambie be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Petition.